Last Sunday, I was trying to help you understand, if you were here, um, how Paul talks about baptism in the sixth chapter, halfway to chapter 12. And one of the things we'd love to do is to have all of us who are believers in Christ, to all of us remember our baptism, to continue to do that. And so this morning, and, and for the weeks of this Romans 12 living series, we want, to, we want to have just a brief moment, a simple way of doing, remembering our baptism. So there'll be some lines up on the screen, and I'll, let's see if we can get those up there. And I'm going to read the, the white part, and we'll have you read the bold, I think it should be in gold. Um, are we ready? Oh, I'm sorry. I, that's up to me. They, they can't do it. On the other side, it was so, they're looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Uh, we switch to him? <laughs> no wonder. <laughs> so let's remember our baptism. It's, it's a wonderful thing to recall. Friends, remember your baptism. Baptism. <laughs> By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the body of Christ, baptized into his mission. Remember that we are marked as Christ's own forever. Baptism signifies that we die to our old lives of sin and rise to new life in Christ. And if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him. Our baptism calls us to live in that are pleasing to God, following the example of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And friends, this is the basis for our Romans 12 living, what God has already done in giving us new life in Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, in, in fact, last Sunday, we did talk about how we all have a debt of sin from mistakes and wrong turns we have made away from God and how God has paid for that debt, has paid in full for that debt through Jesus Christ upon the cross. We briefly reviewed the Romans road and we looked at some of the key verses describing how God has responded to us out of mercy, tremendous mercy. It's a road to salvation a road to eternal life, it's a, it's a road of forgiveness, and even to new life that begins here and now. So hopefully by now you are also understanding, therefore, is the hinge between the opening 11 chapters and the final five chapters of the book. It's, it hinges what God has already done, and Paul takes us a tour of that in Romans 1 through 11, but then Romans 12 is about what do we do in response, and that's why I'll be saying all the way through this series, we are a therefore community. You and I are a living response to God's love and mercy. It's not trying to earn God's mercy, not trying to prove anything. No, we just live in response to what God has done already. And our response means, first of all, to live as an offering to God. And, and, and this morning, or actually last week, we, we read... Uh, the opening verse of Romans 12 in the message, to paraphrase. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. So that was first, live as an offering to God. And this morning we look at Romans 12, verses 3 to 8, and the challenge to live to live now as an instrument of grace. Let's pray. God, you are the master craftsman. You're the virtuoso. You're the maestro of all creation. And we thank you that we are a part of what you have made and thank you for the ways that you call us into service. Come now and speak, Lord. Be here with us. Make clear to us how it is that we can live in ways that are pleasing to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to Paul and grace to all. That's the assumption underlying this passage. 
Grace to Paul and grace to all. Every one of us is graced by God. God distributes grace to all of us. In fact, that's part of what baptism represents. We are baptized with water and spirit. That Holy Spirit presents us, confers upon us some gifts. And we are, we're baptized into Jesus' mission. It's not just baptized into salvation. We also get baptized into a purposeful mission. Now, Paul certainly understood that when he writes. He understood he's, a, he's an apostle and a teacher and, and an encourager because of that. He says, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. He understood that he was an instrument of grace. But not just preachers and prophets. It's for all of us. Every single one of us is a recipient of that grace. And he says later in verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace that's given us different gifts, but all of us are recipients of it. Each one of us is on the receiving end. You are a recipient. You are also a representative of God's grace. It's an amazing thing to think. It's a little bit like saying to you, you're an incubator. All right? God's grace comes and it, it, it comes to work inside of you. It allows gifts to start to flourish and to grow inside of you. And, and then at some point, you know, those gifts become very obvious and expressive and manifest in your life. They show up. It's a beautiful thing to, to know that God's grace is never finished with us. It's always working, transforming us and giving us. My, my gifts are different now than what they were 40 years ago. And if I live to be another 20 years, I'm sure they'll be different 20 years from now. But we continue to have gifts that are part of God's grace at work in our lives and gifts to share. I'm going to follow this morning the lead of a great writer, Marva Dawn, who wrote an entire book on Romans 12. And she picks up on a word play that Paul uses, actually in verse 6. There he, he uses a couple different choices he might use for the word gifts. Paul uses the word in Greek, charisma, for gifts. That's the Greek word, plural, charismata, from plural. But he uses that word, yes, yes, that's where we get our word charisma, or charismatic, our English word charismatic. But notice also it comes from the root word of charis, which is grace. It's significant because Paul is saying that whatever gifts we have, whatever talents, aptitudes, strengths we have, they are rooted in God's grace. It's a gift to us. So Marva Dawn, whenever she comes to talk about the gifts, she always calls them grace gifts. Grace gifts. Just to make sure we know we're not talking about a, a little package like Miss Susan showed the children, right? Grace gifts. Make sure we know what we're discussing. And it's a beautiful thing. We, God's grace never stops giving, never stops transforming. That's the assumption. Grace to Paul and grace to all. But the starting point for the grace gifts is humility. Paul writes... Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. You see, even, even before Paul talks about the different gifts that we have, he says, now wait a minute, don't get too high-minded about this. Doesn't matter what skill set you have or anybody has, we all need to understand ourselves in light of humility. Humility is a starting point for the these gifts. Actually, humility is necessary for community, isn't it? To be in a healthy community, there has, to be, there has to be a sense of humbleness, and it's the right way to follow Jesus, who humbled himself when he came out of heaven. Philippians 2 tells us he humbled himself to come into this human form and to suffer and to be obedient even to the cross. So humility, basic in our faith. John Newton, who, who wrote Amazing Grace, one time said, I, I'm persuaded that love and humility are the highest attainments in the school of Christ. And the brightest evidence is that he indeed is our master. Paul advises us, keep things in proper perspective. Keep it in perspective. Whatever good we, we might be able to do, whatever potential we have for doing something worthwhile, where does it come from? It comes from God. Remember where it's rooted. I, Jerry West was one of the all-time greats in basketball. 
And, and, and one time he said this, I'm not Superman or Captain Marvel. I'm just a guy, flesh and blood, nervous, scared to death sometimes, who has found he can put a basketball into a basket pretty easily, and who's found he can do it best when it's important. This is a very nice thing. It's not discovering a cure for disease or pulling people out of a burning building, but it's what I do, and it's very nice for me to be able to do it well. Now, in an era of swagger and self-promotion, I love his tone, don't you? I just love that tone. I mean, he doesn't deny the fact that he's got the ability. We shouldn't be denying gifts that we have because they're God giving them to us. Don't deny it. But he also doesn't inflate his importance or his role. He sees it in a very healthy way to acknowledge our abilities. It's like saying, I'm thankful that God has conferred this ability or this capacity upon me, and I want to do the best I can to use it. That's, that's a healthy way to handle giftedness abilities. Genuine faith emphasizes God's role, not what we do. It emphasizes, it elevates God's grace and not our own achievements. And that leads to the function of the, of the grace gifts, enhancing and extending the body of Christ. Paul wrote in verses 4 and 5, he said, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. This is one of several places where Paul uses the metaphor of body to describe the organic connections that we have as believers in Christ. And the various members and how they all support the overall purpose. And who's the head of the body? Jesus Christ is the head. It's a beautiful way of describing it. I'm so grateful that as I was growing up, I had many opportunities uh, to be a part of a team, a baseball team, and basketball team, a debate team, and a football team. And many of you have had similar experiences, or maybe you were part of a chorus, choir, or a band, orchestra, or you've been part of, a, maybe in your career, a significant um, part of that was being on an engineering team or a sales team or part of a small company or large corporation, but within it, you knew that you, were, you had something to contribute in a way that all connected together. One of my seminary classmates in the class of 1981, Craig Barnes, is now returned to Princeton Seminary as president. And Craig has had a distinguished career as a pastor and as a professor and an author of several books. And, and he recalls a time when he was called to lead a funeral for a man who had helped to design the Boeing 747. And um, Craig commented, as he was sitting down with the man's widow and planning the service, he commented to her, wow, that must have been really something to be a part of the team that put that 747 up. And she said, and I quote, she said, to tell you the truth, he worked on one little switch box, smaller than a loaf of bread. <laughs> That's all he worked on for 15 years. But when that 747 lifted off the ground for the first time, it was the happiest day in his life. Ah. Now think about that, devoting a decade and a half to something about this big. But he knew he was part of something much greater. He understood that it was only a tiny fraction of the overall scope of that project. But it couldn't take off and fly properly without it. And he knew he was contributing something to that great project. And the same is true for us with our grace gifts. All of us have something to contribute, and what we're a part of is far greater than what we can see or imagine. It takes off and it goes where we can't even see. And we're in on that. We get to be part of that. And Jesus knows it. He, he wants us to be in on this. I mean, he's the, after all, he's the head engineer. He's the, one that, he's, he's the designer. He's the project manager. And he knows that we all have different ways of contributing, and he, he wants every single one of us to be in on it, to be a part of it. 
And the variety of grace gifts is as different as each one of us is unique. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. And, and, and actually, Paul here emphasizes the word different, the way he writes it. He puts the word different at the end of the sentence, at the end of the clause. It's, it's for emphasis. It doesn't show up in our English translation, but it's like he, he goes all the way to the sentence and it says different. Modifies gifts, and then he goes on to talk about what the different gifts are. This is very important to him, this tremendous, dazzling diversity. I heard this week that Gene Engelberger, one of our members, was a part of the Village's Seabreeze basketball team that very recently went to Utah for an international competition. And they, they won a gold medal against international competition in basketball at the Huntsman World Games. That's pretty cool. But what's even more spectacular to me is that Jean used her energy and her athleticism to bless children. She was here at the Vacation Bible School, using her ability to really encourage and bless and instruct kids. It was wonderful to see she knows what she can do and, and how she can use that. One of my close friends in Cincinnati, Dr. Ted Barrett, is a neuropsychologist, a brilliant guy. He's also an amateur magician, and, and he's a ball of fun. He shows up at all kinds of events in all kinds of costumes, you know, just doing anything that's kind of crazy situations to make people laugh, to get their attention, and, and uh, he uses magic to teach. He uses it to make a point. It's wonderful what he does. Uh, it's, it's, it's a gift. He's cultivated and, and he uses it brilliantly. Earlier this year, Jan Carpenter finished her earthly journey here at North Lake to go to the banquet table in heaven. And, and she, before, before she died, she had learned how to twist balloons into all kinds of shapes and animals, much to the delight of hundreds of children. One of the ways that she acquired, developed a gift that she could use. 23 years ago, I, w I was leaving a church in Pittsburgh and going to Cincinnati, and, and there was a couple in the church that had actually left, moved out of state shortly before that, and, and they wrote to me, and it was a wonderful uh, word of encouragement as I was moving on, and, and they wanted to send me a gift, and so um, they, they mailed to me um, a gift that showed up as a loose-leaf notebook and um, explained it in a letter on the first page. And, and what it said was, Regina was the name of the wife, and she said that um, they had been using a particular devotional book for years, and they thought it would be a, a, a great gift to give me. Unfortunately, when she went to go buy it, she said, well, here, I'll, I'll put it up on the screen because it's, it's written right here on this opening letter. When I tried to purchase it, I was told it was out of print. So I spent a day typing it. As several times we thought, Jeff would like this. Now there's the precious gift of time. Not to mention her typing ability. <laughs> of more than 80 pages of that devotional, and including the copyright page. <laughs> but, what, you know, there are all kinds of ways in which we can bless and serve and give to others. So many different blessings. Uh, ways that we can uh, try to do something. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, Mike d delivered an excellent message on the wounded healers. Remember that, if you were here? And it had to do with how, how it may be our, our, our fractures or failures or scars or problems can be experiences that we can use to, to be able to help and bless somebody else, to be an encouragement to someone else. Um, one of the things I noticed immediately when I arrived at North Lake is how many here are comfortable and really good at praying for others and praying with others? That's, it's one of the hallmarks of North Lake. You should never take that for granted, that gift and how it proliferates in this church. It's a great gift to be able to exercise. All of us can work on that gift, but it's here already in strength. 
Elder uh, Charlotte Hornback on our session, she uses a particular um, acronym um, to talk about the totality of who we are and what we have to share for the good of the body of Christ. Stride, she uses. Right? Spiritual gifts, talents, resources, individuality, dreams, experiences, all of that creates the totality of who we are and each of us uniquely has something to give. And that continues to morph all the way through our lives. Everyone has a unique set of abilities. Maybe you've been a project manager as a part of your career. I'd love to talk to you. I would. I, I would love to, to have a project manager come in and do a little coaching with our staff and our elders and leaders. Not, we're doing great things already, but I know it can even be better. And I'd love to have somebody with that knowledge come and, and coach and encourage um, North Lake leaders. Or maybe, maybe you have, a, we know there are folks here who have a medical background. Some are taking blood pressure right now. And we know there's some who have a law enforcement background. It'd be really good for us. If you have that background, it's good for us to know it. Because it can help North Lake if there's an emergency, if we need somebody, something or something on a Sunday morning, even knowing that. Maybe there's somebody here who's got a background in statistics. I'd really like to talk to you as I'm trying to process over 900 surveys. At least to get some of your counsel on how to interpret the results. You know, I'd, th th there are all kinds of ways in which we can help one another and be blessed. Every single one of us has something, some gifts to be shared. All of us can send a, a word of encouragement. Everybody can do that. I, I was uh, going through a, some files earlier this week at home, and I ran across a letter that I received about five years ago, and it was from an attorney and a friend in the church. And, and as I read the letter again, I hadn't looked at it for five years, tears just started streaming down my face. I remember why I kept the letter. <laughs> and it was, it, was, it was beautiful because it was talking about some specific things we had shared together in Christ. And, and it, was, it was very affirming, but it was also kind of looking ahead. And it, it was just blessed me. You know what? Every single one of us has the capacity to bless somebody else with encouragement. Pastor Mike already mentioned that this, this is Staff Appreciation Month. Actually, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. No, 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 wait, 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 no. So here's the point. Hallmark sells lots of cards, you know, by doing it. But, but, what I want to, but what I want to make sure you know is, I feel, Bobby and I have talked about this at our pastoral staff, we feel so beloved and encouraged in being here and, and affirmed in many ways and appreciated. So I, let, let's, I said, let, let's make this staff appreciation. What I would love is for you, I'll be happy if I don't get another card, if all of those go to members of our staff, right? If you would pick out somebody on our technical crew, somebody who helps to, you know, on the maintenance staff, the office staff, music staff, just pick out somebody. You may not know them, or you may know them a little bit, or you may know them really well. Pick out somebody on the staff and just say, appreciate what you're doing. It makes a difference in your own words. And do that for others in your world and way. Uh, we, we, these are gifts we all have to share with others. Uh, I think Dr. Randy Bradham, one of our members, has a great perspective on this. In fact, we're going to listen just a minute and a half to what he says about this. For me personally, it probably goes back to the way I was raised. Uh, my parents, both of them, were Sunday school teachers for decades. And uh, as a matter of fact, as a teenage boy, I was often pressed into service by my father to teach a, class, a Sunday school class at the church if another teacher didn't come because they were sick or something. So it was kind of a family tradition uh, to serve. And uh, we served so much, in fact, that we were at the church almost every day for one thing or another. But uh, in my travels around the country with my job, I've, I've been a member of a number of different churches. And, and, and I think it's true, the old saying that 10% of the people in the church do 90% of the work. I've always thought that was inappropriate and that it would be better if we would all do our fair share and serve. And, and Romans 12 is, is, is a wonderful instruction in that, in that regard, where it says we should serve according to our talents. And it, it lists seven talents, and there are many more, of course, but 
Uh, and teaching is one of those talents. And so I enjoy teaching uh, a Sunday school class at 9.30 on Sunday morning. And we, we go through the Bible and uh, it's, uh, it, it's a service that I enjoy doing. It takes three or four hours a week just to prepare for it. But it's one of the things that I can do. And I think if each of us does a personal inventory, one of those seven talents mentioned in Romans, at least most of us will have at least one of those. Wow. I think if I weren't leading worship at 9.45, I'd be in his class. That's well, a personally. great way of, of looking at it. And um, it, it, it's so helpful to think about the variety of ways in which we can serve. He refers to the seven talents or seven gifts. And look, here's what they are. If your gift is prophesying, this is Paul writing now, he says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. There are many, many, there are many, many more gifts. It's just, this is just a sampler. And some of the gifts that show up are um, more obvious. You know, like they may show up on the stage like somebody doing guitar like Mac or somebody singing like Mike or drumming, I mean, Ralph. I mean, there's just different gifts that show up and they're very obvious, but there are also a lot of gifts that, that, sh that, that are more hidden and not as well known. And, and they're there and we have them to use and to share. And the whole point of what Paul is saying is don't bury your talent. Whatever gift you have, whatever it is, put it to good use. Jesus gives an entire parable on this, parable of the talents, right? Don't bury your talent. Put it to good use. Share it with others. Romans 12 Living is about that. It's about understanding we are recipients of grace, and so we continue to use whatever gifts we've been given to, ex to enhance and extend the body of Christ. That's the culture. That's the expectation at North Lake. And by the way, we're trying to, we're trying to build on that. To, to make it even stronger, more intentional, more effect, effective. One of the things we're doing is we've created a team of ministry coaches. So any of the folks who come to North Lake 101, the, the, the new member class, there'll be somebody who can meet with you one-on-one -on -one or as a couple and talk with you about what your passions and experiences are and how that could plug in to North Lake. Individual coaching sessions for everybody. We think that's really important to try to help everyone feeling like our gifts are being used in the cause of Christ. You know, it's believed that master instrument maker Antonio Stradivari built nearly a thousand violins before he died in 1737. And it's estimated that half of those violins survive but only 244 of them show up on the official list of authenticated Stradivarius violins. So if you have one, <laughs> it's worth something. Yes, it is. One of our worshipers at the church I served in Cincinnati, Paul Bartell, he was a, he was a school teacher, he taught music, and he realized that the, so many students needed to have instruments, he opened a small business called a Baroque violin. And, and so he, he rented and repaired violins and other, other instruments, mostly for school students and then eventually for um, universities in town, etc. And guess what? His business did really well. And Paul today owns a Stradivarius, uh, built in 70, made in 1703. The Lady Harmsworth, it's called. They're all named. Now, for several years, our church uh, in Cincinnati had a small orchestra, uh, 20 to 25 people who would play in worship. And, uh, and they ranged in age from high school students uh, all the way up to senior citizens and, and, and all levels of talent. But they'd come together, they rehearsed, and they'd play once a month. And in the violin section was Paul with his strad. And it was, it was really amazing. He, you know, he'd bring this in. We had good acoustics, and he loved to play there. Uh, he was actually, I mean, he was very generous. He actually would allow people to hold it with close supervision. And it's, it's now on loan to a professional violinist. Um, he would bring that to play. I remember asking him the first time I, about him bringing it. 
And he said, well, Jeff, it's not doing any good at home. And I want to bring the best that I have to worship. And, and you know, this instrument gets better the more you play it. The more you play it, the better it sounds. If you want to keep its sonorous quality, you need to keep playing it. And that's true. And it's true for all of us. And I want you to know, you, you are far more valuable than a Stradivarius. You are a spectacular instrument of grace by what God does through the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. And you have your own tone and you have your own resonance. And you are far better in use than you are in a museum. So let's live as instruments of grace. Let's pray. God, we thank you for all the ways in which you work in our lives. Your grace just never quits. Your amazing grace is always at work in us and through us. Help us to understand what that means. Help us, every one of us individually, to do that inventory, to think about what is it that I have that I can offer, contribute at this time in my life. And the Lord, engage us in your mission with what happens here at North Lake or out in the community and in your mission field. We pray humbly but we pray proudly as a part of your body, the body of Christ. Amen.